how did this book come about? <clears throat> and the title too. Alligator Business Solutions, Building a Solid Foundation to Make Better Business Decisions and, and Gain a Competitive Advantage. Well, I had been searching for a long time because I work with so many small businesses and looking for a book that I could give to my clients to help them understand the financial side of things. Because most of them ignore it. They don't understand it and so they kind of put it on the back burner and that's fine when you just got a couple of employees but at some point if you're not uh, in, uh, actively involved with understanding the financial side you're going to get in trouble and I saw that happen many times and uh, some more catastrophic than others but so I bought eight of these books and I brought one of them with me um, I'm not going to tell you the title of it because I don't want to embarrass the author but I bought eight of these things. They're the most boring things on the planet. Uh, in fact, to give you any, this is my favorite example. Chapter one is a, an introduction. Chapter two, glossary of key financial accounting terms. Now, how many of you are going to read through that as a small business owner to get to the meat of the things? I mean, it's going to put you to sleep in the terms. That's out of context anyway. So I finally decided, well, there's really nothing out there uh, so I decided I would write something that hopefully is humorous, has some true stories, good and bad. I'll relate some of those to you today. And um, something that will be engaging enough that people will want to plow through some of the accounting stuff. Um, as I got into it, I realized that it's more, uh, there's more to it than just the financial decision making. And all of your decision making is, can, you can have a great financial decision, but if it's not in alignment with the foundation of your business, and we'll talk more about that. So my editor said, you got two books here. And I said, Bronwyn, I, I, there's only one book in me. So, uh, but it fit together, so we could, you got to align things. So we're going we're to talk about that. Now, why alligators? Uh, when I first moved to Bluffton 15 years ago, uh, there was a story in the paper about a man who in a gated community who was, I, I won't name the community, who was suing the community because he'd been attacked by an alligator in his backyard. He was out doing yard work, he grabbed his arm. He got away, by the way, by poking his fingers in its eyes. So remember that if you're ever grabbed by an alligator. <laughs> Three months later, there was a follow-up story where the man had withdrawn his lawsuit. Seems his wife had been feeding the alligator for two years. That's why it was in his backyard. <laughs> now, alligators have been around for 150 million years. So they're very successful. And that's what we all want is long-term success. Are they, can you teach an alligator? Can you train an alligator? <laughs> well, you can train them, as the, that story just shows, in the sense that where to look and what to look for and they know what to do with what they find and that's all a small business owner needs to know on the financial side they don't need to be an accountant do debits and credits but they got to know where to look what to look for and how to use the information so i've tried to, to make that as simple as possible an alligator you only got to feed once <laughs> they will never forget that that's right and their strategy is to lurk and lunge now, to me, a prudent business owner should be doing the same thing. What are you doing? What is that alligator doing when he's lurking? He's getting prepared to lunge. How many times have you, I've seen it, I see it all the time where uh, somebody decides to go into the business and they simply open their doors. There's no prior planning. They just, I've, I've got a skill, I know how to cook, I know how to, to take care of lawns, whatever it is, I'll just start a business. Uh, and that's why the, the failure rate for small businesses is so high because there's really no planning. That lurking part of that alligator, he's preparing to lunge. But you know, as we get out here and start making business decisions, there's a lot of conflicting signals. Uh, I, I took this picture up in Alberta, Canada. We were in the middle of nowhere. I have no clue what the important intersection was. There was an intersection there. And why it was important, I can't tell you, because there wasn't, it was flat as a pancake and there wasn't anything for miles and miles and miles. 
And sometimes we get to make choices it's hard to, to figure out. So how do you condense all this stuff? I want to ask you a question. What is the number one key to success in your business or in your career? Passion. 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 What else? Happiness. Happiness. Planning. Planning. Goals. 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 Execution. Knowledge. Yeah, I heard execution. <laughs> All right. I need a volunteer, Dana. Come up here. I'm going to show Dana the number one key to success in her business and in her life. And I've got it right here. <laughs> if I can get it open. <laughs> what is it? Me. <laughs> Absolutely. The key to the success of every organization is you. You've got to become a better you. If you want to improve cash flow, improve the organization. There's lots of things that I, I talk about that you can do in a different presentation on improving cash flow. But long term, if you want to improve cash flow, you've got to improve the organization in a lot of different ways. If you want to have a more productive career, and I assume that's why all of you are here, you need to improve you. It's a lifelong, continuous learning process. And one of my favorite sayings is, nothing in nature is stagnant. It's either growing or decaying. That's true of people. It's true of organizations. So it's a lifelong process. And the, the Army used to have a slogan, I can't remember exactly, but it was, be the best that you can be. Well, be the best you that you can be. So, can, you know, reading and learning is, is key. Now, wouldn't it be great if you or your company had the perfect brand? Now, I define the perfect brand as a product that everybody wants, there's no competition, and your customer service sucks. <laughs> now, that's, that's hard to find, but I found it. I found it. I want to introduce you to a lodge in the Yukon Territories where my wife and I were on a bus trip. And we left Whitehorse, and we were two hours down the road in the middle of nowhere, and of course the bus stopped every couple hours for a break. And she told us, she said, there's a guy here that makes the best cinnamon blondes that you've ever had. Now, I love cinnamon buns. Some of you know what's coming here. Uh, and I just had breakfast. I was full, but I thought, man, I, if it's a good cinnamon bun, I've got, to, I've got to try it. And then she warned us. She said, this guy is mean and nasty. You know, and, and he, was, he doesn't care. And his, his place here is on the, where the ice road truckers come through in the winter. So in the summer, he gets the bus traffic. In the winter, he gets all the ice road truckers stopping here. So we got up to the counter. What do you want? You know, it really made you feel welcome. But the cinnamon bun, <laughs> took us three days to eat it. I got to admit, I ate most of it. That's my wife, not the proprietor. Uh, and so while we were there, a helicopter landed. Two guys got out. They went in. They each bought three cinnamon buns and flew off. I mean, this guy, he has the perfect brand. Uh, he's up there, and people come from miles around just to get his cinnamon buns. But the problem is the rest of us have to compete. And we can't do that because we don't have that perfect brand. So we've got to uh, be continually improving ourselves. Now, how many of you in here are leaders? Raise your hand. The answer is every one of you. In some capacity, you are a leader. And I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm just not leadership material. Leadership is a learned skill. It's a, one that you constantly improve on. But whether you're a leader in your company, whether you're a leader in your family, whether you're the leader of your own career, just the leader of yourself, you are a leader. And you can learn. And that leadership is a critical factor in small business success. Uh, you're not going to be able to, as you grow and you add employees, you're not going to be able to supervise people if you don't develop some leadership skills. And those are things you're not born with. Those are things that you develop. Vision. 
Where do you want to go? You know, you'd be amazed the number of small business owners that I talk to, and they'll say, well, I don't know. Well, I mean, how do you, how do you make a plan to get where you want to go if you don't know where you want to go? In fact, and it's interesting, a lot of people are afraid to express that vision because, well, how am I going to accomplish that? You know, it seems so long, far-fetched, difficult. Yet don't solve the problems first. Now, I want to give you an example. I, I'm working with a, a fellow over in Bluffton right now. When we sat down, he said, right now my company does $125,000 in revenue. I'd like to get to 250. So great. So I, and when I coach people, I don't consult, I coach. My job is to help people figure out how to do it, not to do it for them, so that they can do it when I'm not there. Um, and so the next week he came back, and uh, all of a sudden his vision was a million. Well, what happened? The next time we got together, it was two million. I gave him one simple exercise to do and he came in and he was all excited and he said, man, this, you know, he was bouncing off the walls. And I said, what's, what's, so, what's all the enthusiasm, Paul? And he said, because when I did that exercise that you gave me, I figured out how to get to where I really wanted to go. And uh, so your vision, and I see people all the time, you, you know, you can't get somewhere unless you are willing to specify where you want to go. And then you have to decide. Do you know what a dwit is? That, that's an ancient term I made up. <laughs> people are pe that people that do whatever it takes. Now I don't mean that you do whatever it takes to the exclusion of your family, your spiritual life, or whatever. But if you want to get something done, and I've got Joel Eisner's name on there because in 2002 or one, I can't remember which, I went to a national IMA convention, and he was the national um, IMA financial executive of the year. And he, had, he and his partners had a floor covering, a floor covering uh, business up in uh, Baltimore area. And he commented during the presentation for the last six years they'd grown 25% a year in revenues. Well, I was just new at Savannah Manufacturing, so I was curious, well, how did you do that? You know, I'd like to know, is there some secret marketing campaign or you know, secret sauce that you did to, to grow your business? So I went up to him after his presentation and I introduced myself and I said, Mr. Eisner, I said, how did you achieve 25% of your growth? And he said, we decided to. Now think about that. That is the most, one of the most powerful statements I have ever heard. And it fits into what I like to call a committed decision. There's decisions that people make for New Year's resolution that, that, that are forgotten two days later. And then there's committed decisions. And I'll bet you every single one of you at some point in your life has made it a, com a committed decision, you just didn't think of it that way. You know, I, as I was writing this, I thought about one, I've got several, but when I was in high school, we sold magazines. Did you, I don't know if you all did that. I don't know what we were raising money for, but, uh, the prize for who sold the most was a record player. Now, some of you don't even know what that is. <laughs> but back then, that was a big deal, and I knew my parents couldn't afford a record player, and I wanted it. And, but you gotta remember, back then I was very shy, uh, unbelievably shy. And so, uh, but I wanted that record player. And I knocked on every door within walking distance of every neighbor, whether I knew them or not, and each day, you know, you'd go to high school and you'd turn in your magazine sales. And uh, after a while, the other kids, they quit. They said, well, Roy's already sold so much. I mean, you know, when the results were tabbed, I outsold everybody eight to one. Here I was scared to death that somebody would outsell me and they would get the record player. But what I had done without realizing it was committed a decision to do whatever it takes to get the reward that I wanted. And I, I want you to reflect back on your life and you will probably think of one or more, probably more, examples where you've done the same thing. Um, I want to talk about SMART goals. How many of you heard of SMART goals? Nobody? No, oh, okay, we got a couple over here. 
I added an S on here because I think it's critical. SMART goals are things that are specific, they're measurable, they're attainable, they're relevant, they're timely. Now what's left? What's the last S? When you see people setting goals, there's always one thing missing. They'll say, well, my goal is to increase revenues 25% next year. What's the question that pops into your mind? How are you going to do that? What's your strategy? But most people set goals, but they never come up with a plan to get there. So I'm going to give you an example. Yeah, you can't hit a target you don't have. I mean, so goals are important. But I want to give you an example of a SMART goal. My goal last night was to get up at 6.30 this morning. Is that specific? Is it measurable? Is it attainable? <laughs> Is it irrelevant? I mean, I can't, if I don't wake up this morning, you know, I'm not able to, to make any contribution today. Is it timely? I said 6.30. What's the strategy? Set the alarm. If I didn't set the alarm, there's a, uh, you know, I've got an internal clock, and a lot of times I'll wake up anyway, but some days if I'm really tired, I won't. So you got to have a strategy to get there. Now, I want to talk and spend some time on the foundation of your business or your life, either one. You, if you establish the fundamentals of your business or your life, you will reach success. And I'm going to explain what I mean by fundamentals. But I, I, when you've heard sports teams that have won the Super Bowl or the World Series or the Stanley Cup or whatever, and they interview the players and they say, how'd you do it? A lot of times, what do they say? The well, that, the, the team. But they also say, you know, back in spring training, we just start emphasizing the fundamentals. Just do the basics, blocking and tackling. And in baseball, it's stealing bases and bunting and, you know, not the home runs and stuff. The fundamentals. And my favorite story of that is John Wooten, who was the legendary basketball coach for UCLA, who before every practice and every game said, gentlemen, today we're going to learn how to tie our shoes. And he would have them take their shoes off, put them back on, put their socks on, and tie their shoes according to his instruction. Now, why was he so attentive to little details? Because in a basketball game, if your foot is loose in the shoe and you slip, and you don't make the cut, not only could you get injured, but that one point that you missed could be the difference in the game. So having the fundamentals is, uh, is very important. It defines your business philosophy and culture. And so many small businesses haven't really figured out who they are. And you can't market a business until you know who you are. But if I was to start climbing the stairway from where I am today to where my vision is, what's missing on that stairway? What's holding it up? There's no support for it, you know. So if you did this with Legos, you know, eventually it would just fall over. And probably it wouldn't take very long. So having the support for it is critical. And uh, this was the first pass at, at this thing. But your fundamentals are your fundamental purpose, your fundamental values, your fundamental operating procedures, and your fundamental information systems. Those are the things that I think are key to the success of every business. And if your financial decisions, marketing decisions, HR decisions, all of that aren't in alignment, then you're going to have problems. Let's talk about, look at it from a little different analogy, building your house. You all live in a house or live in an apartment or so, so you're somewhat familiar with how a house is put together. And after you've got the blueprint and everything, which is your vision of what you want it to, to look like, if you were going to build a house, then what are you going to do? You're going to lay the what? The foundation. Okay. So the foundational planks here of our thing is the fundamental purpose. The fundamental values, we're going to talk about each one of these, uh, operating principles, and information systems. 
Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put some walls up, right? The walls in this analogy are the operating departments of your business. Now whether you're a sole proprietorship or General Electric, you all have all the same business functions. Uh, operations, uh, oh, you, you can see that better than I can on the, am I blocking? No, not at all. Now, as you put the walls together, what do they have to be related to the foundation? Connected. Connected. They have to be in alignment, don't they? It, you, your walls have to be plumb. If they're not plumb, your house is going to be skewed, and at some point in the future, that's going to create problems for it. Same thing is true of a business. I call the plumbing and the electrical your IT system that kind of pulls everything together. The roof is your risk management. Now, most businesses add this first instead of last. But what do you, what, once you got all the stuff put together, what's the last thing you do when you build a house? You do the landscaping and you do the, the you know, some of the interior uh, upgrades and so forth. I call that the marketing side of it. Most businesses start off with the marketing. I've got an idea, I go into business, I put out some social media, some emails, some print ads, whatever, but they haven't figured out who they are yet, and so those marketing messages can be disingenuous, and if people do think that you're not who you say you are, uh, you may have some short-term success, but probably not long-term success. So if you do it right, and you come up with a really nice house. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with that, that's built more up in, uh, in Asheville. So it's, uh, go up there sometime, you get an amazing tour of it. So let's talk about your fundamental purpose. This is why you're in business other than to make money. Now all businesses have to make money in order to fulfill their purpose, but that's not why you're in business. What's your passion or cause? What are you trying to accomplish? How will you benefit people? Now, what problems do you solve? Now, if you ever watch Shark Tank, uh, a lot of times uh, Kevin O'Leary in particular likes to say, well look, you've, you've solved the problem that doesn't exist. Uh, and sometimes business, people start businesses thinking, well it's a great idea and everybody needs it, but there's a difference between needing it and wanting it. And so uh, you got to define what the purpose is that you're trying to accomplish with your business. Johnson & Johnson was established back in 1850 something or other with a very simple purpose. We are in business to alleviate human pain and suffering. Now they've been around for a long time. Very simple purpose, it'll never be fully accomplished. <coughs> but it guides their whole philosophy of their business. So you got to define what your purpose is. What about values? Values are things that you will never co uh, compromise. Now, they may be about people, the environment, spirituality, family, business practices. There's a lot of different things. But if you violate those things, you're going to have trouble. Uh, and so I've, I've seen, and you, I'm sure you've seen people that have done things in their lives that are contrary to who they really are, and it leads to all kinds of problems. Um, your values are the ingredients for your success, and I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute. It defines who you are as a business person and a, uh, as a business and as a person. So you want to define what those values are. A lot of times people just define, well, I'm, I'm honest, you know, I'm. I've got great integrity and so forth, and then those are great values. But don't stop there, because there may be other things about your business that you say, well, this is something, you know, we're going to do this no matter what. This is our value. The difference is operating principles, they are how you do things. Now, we're not talking SOPs. I'm going to give you an example of Southwest Airlines. They are operating principles, they have two that I remember particularly. One was we're only going to grow 20% a year, which I totally agree with. Now, it, when they first started, when they had, and they've been around 40 years now and have been profitable every year. And how many airlines have gone out of business? 
But they said, even though we have opportunities to grow faster than that, we don't want to because we don't want to outgrow ourselves. And, and then we can't deliver the kind of service that we want to. Um, it's kind of the process for in combining the, in the ingredients. The other uh, operating principle of Southwest Airlines is we'll only fly 737s. Now, think about that. From you, you guys are accountants. That means every pilot in the fleet can fly every plane. So if you need a pilot in Kansas City or, or Denver or whatever, yeah, we can get one there. Uh, every mechanic can work on the plane. We only need one parts inventory. So it's much more cost effective. So there's a lot of values to that kind of a philosophy. But they're not SOPs, but they do impose a consistency of action of th and, and uh, decision making. Operating principles may change over time as technology changes, the economic environment changes and stuff, but for most successful companies, they change very slowly. So what's the difference between values and operating principles? Because I, I have a lot of people say, well, you know, really, how does this different. And what does banana pudding have to do with it? I make the best banana pudding on the planet. <laughs> and I, I, and I'll give you an example. We were invited to some neighbors here a couple weeks ago for dinner and I brought some banana pudding and there was another couple there. And so after dinner we had the banana pudding and this lady sitting next to me, she took a bite of it. Just She was being polite. And uh, she said, wow. She said, I don't even like banana pudding. And this is great. The ingredients that go into my banana pudding never change. But how I put the pudding together could change if I find a better process for doing it. Does that make sense? Finally, you got fundamental information systems. Think about this. Is it hard to make a good business decision even if you have perfect information? Yeah, and we can still make the wrong choice. You can do all kinds of an analysis on a particular investment and think it looks like a great thing and it just, there's factors that you can't find out about that company and all of a sudden things are not going well. So it's extremely difficult even to minority make- Minority of the time. Minority of the time. <laughs> <laughs> but think about this. It's impossible to make a good business decision with bad information. <laughs> Unless you get lucky. <laughs> so whether it's your financial information systems, your customer information, your operations information systems, all of those, making sure that those are accurate and that you understand the data that's in there is extremely important. And that's why I put it in one of the foundation fundamentals. And here again, all of that needs to be, all of your operating departments need to be aligned with that foundation. Um, the um, and one of the places this is will really help you is in the HR field. You know, when you're hiring an employee, one of the difficult things is you don't know what you've got until six, eight, 10, 12 months into the, into the process. Why is that? Because everybody at the beginning is on their good behavior. They want to make a good impression. It's kind of like dating. You know, when you first start dating somebody, everybody's on their good behavior, you know. <laughs> But you don't find out till a long time later. You know, before I met, before uh, Sharon and I started dating, I dated a girl for 11 months. I was this close to proposing, and her whole personality changed. And I thought, wait a minute, who is this? Uh, so your hiring will be improved if you can ask questions in that interview to find out if their values are in alignment with your company values if they are excited about us solving the problem that your company solved, or are they just looking for eight to five? So, uh, systemization, I'm not gonna spend much time on this. I refer my clients to Michael Mills, who's uh, got a software program, which is fantastic. Um, to, uh, he was a certified E-Myth coach for 25 years, and then he developed this software because he, He'd help people put together processes and procedures and then they'd sit in three ring binders on the shelf and they never got updated. So he found out, figured out a way to do that, uh, to what I call McDonaldize your business. 
and seriously every single business and virtually every single process can be systematized. It's particularly important when you have multi locations. Because I don't know what your experience has been. In my experience, when you have multi locations, the people that were in the location I was in thought the people in the other locations didn't know what they're doing. And they didn't think we know what we're doing. I remember uh, being sent down to Texas Eastman from Kingsport in, in Longview, Texas to train them on something. And of course, all I'd heard is how they, these people don't know what they're doing down there. And I got there, they were smarter than we were. Uh, there was a really sharp group. And the people that worked for Dow Chemical, my goodness, they was at Union Carbide, they really don't know what they're doing. Only us in our department. So systematizing things so everybody's on the same page is really important because multi-locations tend to take on a life of their own and people start doing it their way which is not necessarily the company's way. I, don't, I refer people in terms of uh, HR, that's not one of my strong suits but it's, it's extremely important. Uh, on the marketing side, I. Uh, I wasn't going to put a marketing chapter in, I finally decided to because I ran into the same problem that I did with, with accounting. Um, and my MBA was in marketing and I did worked in market research at Eastman. Um, but I kept looking for somebody who could give a small business person an objective opinion on, on a marketing campaign. And everybody I talk to, and you, you see them all the time, they'll say, I'll take care of your marketing. What they really mean is I'll take care of your email, your social media, your print, your TV, your radio, your billboards, whatever that is. But I was looking for a generalist who could give an objective opinion. Well, and I talked to some people that have had advertising agencies and I learned something interesting. Uh, I won't say all, but many of them, they will charge you a fee to put together a marketing program. And they also get a commission from the media they place it with. Now, can they give you an objective opinion then? No. So it's, it's like, you know, you're selling a product, but you're pushing one in particular because that's where you make the most money. But is that in the best interest of the client? So it, it's important. So I, I finally put together some tools to help clients figure out what their best media was. Accounting and finance. I don't need to tell you all that profits are not equal to cash. Uh, I think you all are very much aware of this. Most small business owners are not. Uh, and you don't need to be an accountant. You just need to know where to look, what to look for, and how to use the information. I had a number of different decision-making tools that I want, because I want to make it as simple and easy as possible for small business owners to be able to look at parts of their business at a glance and figure out what's the best strategy for them. These are just a few of them. And that kind of leads back to the flow chart that I gave you, the alligator mentality. It starts with me. I'm the leader. I, I got to envision what I want. You know, I, and I got to be willing to admit to what my vision is. You know, bring it out of the closet at the back of your mind. I decide to do whatever it takes. I'm, I'm a dwit. I establish the fundamentals to succeed. I systematize the operation, operations. I learn what works and what doesn't work. I've got a lot of stuff on best practices and horror stories about businesses that uh, didn't do things. In fact, the, when I first sent, sent the first draft off to my editor, she sent me back three weeks later a 15-page memo uh, of, on assignments that I was supposed to do. I thought I, thought I was done. Yeah. And one of them was, she said, you got to have some success stories in here. All, all, all these things are gloom and doom. And I said, well, you know, not many people come to me when everything's going right. <laughs> <laughs> so I interviewed 16 companies in this area that are very successful. And uh, lo and behold, they were doing the things I recommend you do in the book. So that was very gratifying that, uh, that, uh, that they kind of supported that. But you got to, there are some lessons to learn. You know, they always say that experience is the best teacher. It's a terrible teacher. Because it chews up your life. You're making all these mistakes. And the best teacher is some other turkey's experience. 
If you can learn from that, you can save yourself a lot of trouble, but unfortunately, a lot of people can't really do that. So you got to learn what works. You got to develop the needed skills. Maybe you're not a leader. Maybe you're not a marketing person. Maybe you're not involved in HR, but if you are the owner of the business, you've got to understand all of your business. Simple as that. You know, you can't just focus on the one thing that you know best how to do. Um, you you un obtain tools to help you kind of improve your success rate. You process and use all the, uh, the information. That will lead you to make better decisions. Better decisions will give you a competitive advantage. And then you enjoy lunch. So this is a quote from the, uh, the chairman of the Bluffton uh, Chamber Board of uh, Directors. And it's... He just made this a couple of weeks ago. Were you, were you there when he did it? No, but I know Don. Yeah, you know Don. Uh, and, and I love it. You know, when you're finished learning and changing, you're finished. <laughs>